Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to speak uh, at the keynote session in QCon. Um, I keep telling Wes, you know, QCon is one of my favorite conferences to be at. I feel pretty much at home here. Um, you know, this talk is about um, a big change that I experience um, companies going through in my day-to-day -day job. This change is about how companies manage their data, the resulting ETL technology that they use, and how the rise of real-time data and stream processing is driving that change. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to you know, go through how things work today, uh, what are the drawbacks, you know, what is this new shiny future for ETL look like, and then what role does Kafka play in this picture? So before I start, can I get a quick show of hands of people who've either heard of or have used Kafka in any form or manner? Okay, about 90%. I'm super excited. All right, so let's get started. You know, um, data and data systems, I've observed, have really changed in the past decade. If you think about how things worked uh, about a, roughly a decade ago, data really resided in two popular locations, the operational databases and the warehouse. Most of your reporting ran on the warehouse about once a day, sometimes several times a day. And so data didn't really need to move between these two locations for any faster than several times a day. This in turn influenced the architecture of the tool stack or the technology to move data between places called ETL, and also the process of integrating data between sources and destinations, which broadly came to be known as data integration. But now, several recent data trends, they're driving a really dramatic change in the ETL architecture. First off, these single server databases are rapidly being replaced or augmented by a whole bunch of distributed data platforms. These can operate at company-wide scale, you know, be it NoSQL systems like Cassandra or MongoDB or, or uh, Elastic or NoSQL, you know, other systems, SaaS applications and so on. So your ETL tools um, you know, have to handle more than just databases and the warehouse. There are many more types of data sources that companies are interested in collecting beyond the transactional data sources. These include logs, sensors, metrics. So now your ETL tools need to you know, go beyond handling just the relational data model and be able to support a pretty large variety of data models. And last but not the least, you know, the, the stream data and the rise of stream data, it is uh, becoming increasingly ubiquitous. There is a need for processing data quickly as it arrives instead of in batches. Now, these trends are playing out, but the technology hadn't caught up. So if you were wondering what data pipelines in companies actually look like, you know, this is what I've seen in practice. There are applications that talk to each other using some kind of enterprise messaging queues. There are uh, custom ETL scripts that are written to move data between sources and destinations. You know, this ad hoc manner of connecting sources and destinations in a one-off fashion as they arrive is pretty chaotic. It is unmanageable, it is lossy. In this talk, I want to explore how transitioning to streams cleans up this mess and it works towards a much more you know, scalable, manageable ETL architecture. This is the idea of having a streaming platform that serves as your you know, central nervous system. It allows applications to talk to each other. It allows you to stream change logs from databases and make it available to other systems. And more importantly, or interestingly, it allows you know, stream processing applications to thrive that can transform this data in a much more incremental fashion. Now, before I take a look at the solution, why don't we you know, take a quick look at a short history of how these tools evolved. You know, data integration, it surfaced in the 1990s when retail organizations wanted to analyze buyer trends. The way they did that is by extracting data from operational databases, transforming that data into a single global schema that matches the warehouse, and then loading that data into the warehouse. By the early 2000s, a lot of companies and industries followed this trend, and a new you know, class of technology emerged to essentially 
facilitate this data movement between operational databases and the warehouse called extract, transform, and land uh, uh, load, which is ETL. In its simplest form, it just means copying data between different locations. Now, ETL tools have been around for a while, but the data coverage in warehouses is still pretty low. You know, what I've seen is out of thousands of operational databases, maybe a couple hundreds are really available in the warehouse. And you might think why. Well, it's because um, you know, ETL tools, the traditional ones, they have drawbacks that show up when you try to use them in practice, right? Here are a couple of those drawbacks. One is the need for a global schema. You know, data modeling is a really hard problem in its own right. But modeling you know, one global schema for a very large domain is even harder. And this is really something that limits the plausible scope of either warehouses or ETL tools. The second is that you know, uh, ETL, the T really stands for data cleansing, which is uh, you know, transforming data into its cleanest form and defining what it means. And that process is error prone, it is manual. And as you can imagine from the previous two drawbacks, the operational cost of ETL is really high. You know, it is slow, it is time and resource intensive. Most importantly, you know, ETL tools were built for a niche problem, right? Narrowly focused on connecting databases and the warehouse and do that in a batch fashion. Now, because ETL was narrowly focused on that problem, a new class of technology emerged to connect applications in real time, and that came to be known as enterprise application integration. You know, it is just a bunch of tools that were built to facilitate exchange of business transactions, messages between applications. Unsurprisingly, they used enterprise service buses underneath the covers or enterprise messaging queues underneath the covers. And the problem was that these MQs worked for small scale data. They were just not designed to handle the scale of data that is required for modern data sets like logs and sensors. And so we can't really use this for any kind of company-wide, large-scale, real-time data integration. The summary is that you know, the class of technology available for solving this whole data integration problem, whether it's ETL or EAI, they're really outdated. You know, we, on one hand, you have enterprise application integration. It is real-time, but not scalable. On the other hand, you have ETL, which is scalable but batch. And so organizations you know, face a tough choice when you adopt one of these. You get either real time um, or you get scale but batch, but you have to pick one. Now, these trends are pretty big. You know, they demand not just small change, small changes to these tools, but they actually require a complete revamp. This complete revamp is required to create a technology that is actually suitable to a modern streaming world where real time and scale, they're not the exception, they're pretty much the rule. And so as a result of this, you know, a modern streaming world actually has a new set of requirements for data integration. The first is you have to have the ability to process not just high volume, but high diversity data. It needs to be real time from the grounds up. You know, and you might think, what does that entail? One is we need to have the technology to support that. But the other is, which is equally important, is that we need to make a pretty much fundamental transition to what I'm going to call event-centric thinking. So trying to explain that a little bit more with the help of this example, let's assume this magical streaming platform can support uh, high volume, high diversity data, as well as do that in real time. Uh, now, this is an example of a retail web app. It uh, logs product page view events. And we want to analyze that in Hadoop. So on one hand, we stream those events into a streaming platform. And on the other side, Hadoop subscribes to the streaming platform and loads that data. That works, but at this point, it may not be clear what problem the streaming platform is solving. So if you go one step further, you know, you'll realize that over time, you've um, added more ways of producing these product view events, you launch a mobile app, you create external APIs. When that happens, you will notice in this picture, the Hadoop side of the load doesn't need to change at all. This decoupling that is introduced by the PubSub model in the streaming platform 
It allows things that produce data and things that consume data to evolve on their own because they don't have to know about each other. Going one step further, as you add more downstream applications that need to consume the same product view events but process them differently, you will notice that as you add those, you don't have to add point-to-point -point connections with everything that produces the same data. You merely subscribe to the central streaming platform. So the end result is that you know, what I've observed is event-centric thinking when applied at a company-wide scale is actually the core reason for you know, ending up with a much more cleaner streaming platform and a much more cleaner ETL architecture. The third, is, um, you know, the third requirement is of forward compatibility. So this event-centric thinking actually has another advantage. It allows you to create a forward compatible data architecture. What I mean by that is the ability to add more applications that might need to process data differently. So if you observe in the previous example, right, um, every new application was added to serve a business need that was felt at that time. There was no way to predict that ahead of time. So when we added a re retail web app, we didn't know we might create a mobile web app or, or mobile app in the future. When we had just Hadoop, we didn't know that we might have to add four other ways of processing that same data differently. And this is really important. You know, your ETL architecture, it needs to allow new data sources and new data systems to emerge over time to use the same data differently. So to explore this you know, requirement or this need a little bit more, to enable forward compatibility, that is multiple destinations for the same data, it has a really important implication on what T stands in ETL, which is traditionally for you know, data cleansing but we need to move from data cleansing to data transformations. Let me explain that with an example. Let's say this is the same example. We have the logs. We need to now move them to the warehouse. Traditionally, you might extract that as unstructured text. Your T actually stands for data cleansing, which is really defining what this product view means, all the different fields. And then your load involves loading it into a specific system, which is the data warehouse. And let's say you might need to you know, drop some personally uh, identifiable information fields from this data to really make it usable for the users. So that custom transformation runs in your warehouse. Now what happens if you add another destination for this data? Let's say Cassandra. You will notice that you repeat the business logic for extracting that data. You also repeat the transformation, which is actually cleansing that data and turning it into a real product view. Then you load it into Cassandra, and then you run the same transformation. But this is pretty wasteful. You know, in order to allow more destinations, if we repeat the business logic of cleansing that data, it is um, you know, not only inefficient, but it can also be lossy if one of these scripts fails. What if instead we make clean data available up front, which is we extract and we load just clean product view events into the streaming platform, the transform runs on the streaming platform to create another stream which drops the PII fields. And now you have two choices for loading the data in either the warehouse or Cassandra or anything that might arrive in the future. Now the second implication on this T is you might wonder, well, if clean data is available up front, then does T and ETL completely go away? Not really. It now turns and stands for actual data transformations, to make data ready for destination systems. So for example, if you were to run a query like find me the top and popularly viewed products in a certain price segment, we now have to enrich this data that previously only had you know, all the product view events but filtered on PII fields. When it is done on top of this streaming platform, which has the clean product view events, upgrading your transform you know, becomes simpler. You upgrade it to not just drop events, but now enrich it with product metadata, which might itself be a change log stream from another source database that is available in the streaming platform. And this is great because your, your extraction and transformation is done once, but now your load can be done several times in different systems. They don't have to all repeat that transformation. So to summarize, you know, this point is important. Forward compatibility, it actually stands for, let's extract clean data once. Let's then make it available to be transformed in several different ways 
to load it into the respective destinations, but then do that as and when required. So to summarize, you know, what are the needs of a modern streaming data integration solution? We need scale, we need diversity, latency, and more importantly, forward compatibility. I summarize these needs because you know, they drive the requirements for this solution, right? We need fault tolerance and parallelism so we can deploy lots and lots of these ETL processes to handle large data sources. We need it to support lower latency. Delivery semantics, what about ordering? That is important. Operations and monitoring to be able to you know, view and monitor all your ETL copier processes centrally. And then schema management on how schemas can evolve as you copy data. But these are all hard problems in their own right. Instead of solving them in a one-off way in custom ETL tools that are meant for specific systems, I'm advocating for an approach that is you know, much more practical and efficient, which is let's solve all these problems in a common platform, which is reusable for many different use cases. So now I want to present what a new and shiny future for ETL looks like. This is, in this future, all your data is represented as streams. The central streaming platform, it serves as a storage layer for your stream data. Extract and load involves moving streams between external systems and the central streaming platform. And transformations actually takes the uh, shape and form of stream processing. Now the streaming platform, it serves as you know, almost like a central nervous system for your company's data. It serves as the real-time messaging bus so your applications can exchange messages. It serves as the source of truth pipeline for feeding any and all data processing systems, be it Hadoop or warehouse or NoSQL systems or, or several more. <coughs> and it actually serves as the you know, building block for stateful stream processing microservices or applications which all represent your company's business logic as stream processing. In this future, you know, companies still have the data integration problem. The solution just looks very different in a streaming first world. We still do ETL, but in a streaming fashion, you know, on top of a central platform, redefining what T stands for, which is essentially stream processing. So let me summarize you know, what we've gone through so far before diving into um, the streaming platform. We went through a short history of what uh, data integration is, what are the drawbacks of the ETL tools, what are the needs and requirements for a streaming platform, what is this new and shiny future for ETL look like. And in the latter part of this talk, what I want to go through is, you know, what does a streaming platform look like? How does it enable this streaming ETL? And that journey starts with Apache Kafka. You know, it is an open source distributed streaming platform. We created Kafka to essentially make this event-centric thinking available at a company-wide scale. We had a very particular vision for what a company should look like if it had reimagined its use of data around streams of events. We started Kafka roughly six years ago at LinkedIn. Today, it is deployed at a pretty large scale at LinkedIn. It serves more than 1.4 trillion messages per day across several data centers. And uh, Kafka is now adopted across thousands of companies worldwide, from you know, retail to web tech and uh, fintech and so on. Roughly about 35% of Fortune 500 use Kafka today. So what I want to look into is you know, what role does Kafka play in this new future for data integration. Well, first off, Kafka is the de facto storage of choice for stream data. So most of you are familiar with Kafka. Some of you might also be familiar with this log abstraction. This is what uh, the storage backend of Kafka is based on, which is this concept of a persistent, replicated, write ahead, and append-only log where every record is identified using a unique index called an offset. Writes are only in the form of appends. Readers can use that offset and index into the log and then read messages in order. Now the key insight at the heart of Kafka is that this abstraction is a great primitive 
for building scalable pop-up uh, messaging. So you can imagine that your publisher is the one that appends data to the end of the log, and your subscribers in Kafka land, they maintain their offset, they can index into this log, and then scan sequentially from there onwards. The key point is that the sequential nature of reads and writes, it allows this abstraction to support pretty impressive throughput. So Kafka supports about you know, hundreds of thousands of messages per second per server. The first is you know, Kafka is a storage backend, but Kafka offers a scalable messaging backbone for application integration. So this is what we all know Kafka for. Uh, one of the core APIs of Kafka is the messaging API, which allows you to produce and consume messages, so applications embed these libraries and talk to each other using Kafka. But the second, or, you know, the third way is like Kafka actually enables building streaming data pipelines. In the 09 release of Apache Kafka, the community added a Connect API. The core focus for Connect API is to make building these streaming data pipelines from external systems into Kafka really easy in an off-the-shelf manner. And last but not least, you know, the way Kafka completes this picture for data integration is, is that now it's the basis for stream processing and transformations. In fact, the O10 release of Apache Kafka added the Streams API, which allows you to essentially write stream processing uh, operators or stream processing programs very easily on top of Kafka. You can embed the Streams API and uh, write stream processing in your application. So, in the remainder of this talk, I want to dive a little bit deeper into both the Connect and the Streams API because they really complete the vision for streaming ETL. Now let's start with Kafka's Connect API, which is really the E and the L in streaming ETL. You know, building streaming data pipelines using Kafka is all about these connectors. In this picture, it seems simple to just draw the line and have data flow between any external system and Kafka. But there's a lot that goes underneath the covers to do this correctly. And let's take a step back and look at the system level view of things. That was a logical picture. But streaming ETL today, it might involve moving data between data centers. Companies have multiple data centers for several reasons. You, know, you might be migrating from an on-prem to a public cloud uh, for disaster recovery, mergers and acquisitions. So, any problem that involves moving data between sources and destinations, today, it involves moving data also between data centers in a streaming fashion. Kafka's Connect API, there are two abstractions. Pretty easy to understand. There are sources that pull data from external systems into Kafka, and then there are sinks that push data from Kafka into external sinks. And some of these sources and sinks can be written in both streaming and as well as batch fashion if needed. This is the most interesting you know, ETL problem, as we talked about. How do we make data from databases available to not just the warehouse, but any other application that needs to use it? Now, if you think about it for a moment, in order to do this in a streaming fashion, one way is you can set up triggers, and you can scan the database. And that works, but that is inefficient. Another way is to stream the change log of a database. Now, some of you might be familiar with this. You know, databases are designed like this underneath the covers where they rely on a commit log as the source of truth, and tables are merely views of that commit log. And the way database replication works, for the most part, is by shipping these change logs around. This change log is you know, it's an abstraction where every message is essentially an update or a change or a mutation to the database. So if you were to scan this change log from the very beginning and apply it to an empty database, you can essentially recreate the database. You will notice that this abstraction looks very similar to the log abstraction in Kafka. In fact, Kafka has special support for supporting change logs. And these database connectors are, in fact, the most popular ones written on top of Kafka's Connect API. It has actually another cool advantage, which is by making these change logs available in Kafka, now transformations become much easier and they're much more scalable. So instead of applying transformations on either the source or the destination databases, it can be made available on this 
you know, replicated log, which is a lot faster. So instead of moving data just blindly between the source and the destination, if moved through Kafka, you can transform it and then move it into destination applications. So the core focus of Kafka's Connect API is to really make writing these connectors super simple, you know, to make it available in a really off-the-shelf manner and do all the hard work underneath the covers. So Kafka's Connect API, it, it leverages and it builds on top of Kafka's scalability and fault tolerance model. It allows you one way of monitoring all your connectors. And most importantly, it offers the option of carrying the source schema into all the destination systems. So what you can do is, if you add a column in your source database, what would have previously broken data pipelines now would carry that extra column seam seamlessly throughout the data pipeline and you know, apply it to either the Elastic Index or a Hive table and do that you know, without users knowing about it in a pretty you know, transparent manner. Today, um, you know, there are lots and lots of these sources and sinks all open source available for use. So you can connect a pretty large set of sources and sinks in an off-the-shelf manner using Kafka's Connect API. So then if Connect is E and L, let's now look at you know, the Streams API, which is, really stands for the T in Streaming ATL. Stream processing is all about applying transformations on stream data. Transformations can take many forms, you know, filters, maps, window joins, and aggregations, and so on. Before I take a look at the Streams API, let me take a step back and talk about these broad two visions for stream processing. I got a chance to experience both. The first vision is let's make MapReduce go faster. So let's build a real-time MapReduce layer. Uh, that used to work really well, so let's make it go faster. The other vision is very different. It says, you know, let's look at all your business logic, all your applications, and think of those applications as event-driven you know, stream processors. I mentioned these two visions because they really influence what the solution looks like. So if you think about building stream processing as a real-time map produce layer, now you have a central cluster that runs a whole bunch of processes. You have to express your stream processing code as a job that is packaged in a custom manner, just like Hadoop is. It is deployed and monitored in a custom manner. You probably have Yarn or Mesos for fault tolerance and so on. This model probably works well for you know, long-running analytical type of queries where you want to run a large multi-tenant cluster. Now, event-driven microservices, you know, the focus is very different. It's saying that let's think of applications as things that take input streams, business logic that is really stream processing, and, and then it produces output streams. If you think of that and making that easier, then now your stream processing engine really has to be a library that application developers can just embed and start using. So in this world, you have a Kafka cluster, and then you have your app, and then you don't deploy anything else. And the main focus for this vision is really to make stream processing available as a general purpose programming paradigm. It is not a niche thing, but it is available across the company. Here are some examples of systems that subscribe to the real-time MapReduce vision. In fact, um, I had a chance to work on Apache SAMHSA, which is also um, you know, similar to some of these systems. And while putting it into practice at LinkedIn, we learned that you know, what developers wanted was they wanted to continue developing their Java apps. What we asked them to do is to take some part of their Java app and express it as a job and then talk to the stream processing people to get it deployed on their cluster. So that created sufficient um, you know, friction in order uh, to adopt stream processing at a LinkedIn-wide scale. So then we introduced, you know, we looked at this problem a different way. We, we came at it from the event-driven microservices vision and created streams. So streams is, you know, the streams is just a library. It is an API that you embed in your application, and then you can do stream processing. So really, you know, the core focus that we had when we created Streams was that, you know, let's make it the easiest way 
to do stream processing on top of Kafka. You know, people love the producers and consumer libraries. Let's give them a stream processor library. So as a result of that, you know, this is what it looks like. It is a powerful but lightweight Java library. So all you need is if you have a Kafka cluster, then you have a streams API that can be used to transform Kafka topics. It, is, um, it has a convenient DSL with all sorts of operators, still evolving, but joins, map filter, windowed aggregates, and so on. So this is uh, you know, code you might write. Just as an example, the cliched you know, word count example, you create a builder, you write your code to count the words, and then in this example, the output is just another Kafka topic, but you could send it to any other external system. And then you say start. The cool thing is, you know, you might realize that you can take this code and run it on one instance, and it will run just fine. You can package it in a Docker container and deploy it on Mesos, and your code doesn't have to change. Essentially, all the hard work, which is how do you load balance and assign partitions to all your different application instances, is handled transparently by the streams library because it uh, builds on top of Kafka primitives. Streams is a event at a time stream processing engine, so it doesn't do micro batching. It can process events as they arrive. We've been pretty uh, inspired by all the insights that Google's Dataflow team has shared, which all revolve around you know, how do we handle late arriving data. You know, without going into too many details, the core insight is that we need to accept that there will be late arriving data in when you're processing data in a streaming fashion. We just need to be able to handle it correctly. So the insight is that let's differentiate between event time, which is when an event takes place in the real world, from processing time, which is when it actually gets processed. And if we handle these two things differently, then we might get correct results, even as you get late arriving data. This is a pretty deep topic in and of its own right. I know Tyler um, and Francis are giving a talk on this. I would highly recommend going and uh, you know, learning from those uh, two great engineers. The fifth point is um, Kafka Streams API, it does this cool thing. It has out of the box support for local states. So this is one of the things we learned from Samza that worked well and we adopted it in Kafka Streams API. And it is essential because it really allows you to build these uh, high throughput, fast stream processor apps. So to, to get into a little more detail, you know, if you think about state and how do you manage state in apps, the traditional way is you know, let's, let's stick that state in some kind of external database and get done with it. Now this works, right? You can trust this external database. So um, there are some inefficiencies at the same time. One inefficiency is that there's less isolation, so any app could overwhelm the database. You have less choices for how to pick different databases depending on what your app is doing. And more importantly, um, you know, in order to write a stateful stream processor app, you also have to manage this external database. What Streams does is it, it pushes this external database and divvies it up into shards and makes it available as local embedded state. Now this local state could be a rocks DB engine, it could be an in-memory hash map, and there will be more that come uh, you know, as we make more progress on streams. But the concept is that this is highly efficient because your data is sharded the same way as your input streams. So all your processing can happen locally with the data available. You don't have to make external RPC calls, and hence that is super efficient. More than that, I think this local state is also fault tolerant because it's a local embedded engine. What if your app dies? Does your state go away? Not really. The Kafka, uh, you know, Kafka and Kafka Streams API it knows how to do load balancing, just how it load balances your partitions. So if an app instance dies, it automatically load balances and moves that local state embedded database into the remaining instances that are still alive. And all of that happens without users finding out, so it can self-heal automatically. Another important point about Kafka Streams API is that it allows reprocessing. So if you think about you know, what we do with apps, we upgrade apps, we do A-B testing. And when that happens, we need to reprocess, you know, go back and reprocess either a small window of data or perhaps sometimes the entire history. So let's take an example, right? You deploy an app, 
and a day later you find a bug. So all the results that were processed using the last 24 hour window perhaps are incorrect. So as you deploy the new version of your app, you actually want to go back and reprocess the 24 hours in order to reflect correct results. Now this again is one of the uh, you know, deeper topics to get stream processing right, but it is one that is really important. Now let's, uh, let me conclude with an example uh, to show how these two visions can uh, really influence how your solution looks like. You know, in this example, you're building a real-time dashboard for security monitoring. So you're monitoring user activity across the globe. You're aggregating by geo region. And then in this particular app, you're highlighting regions that have irregular user activity. Now here's your solution, right? If you were using vision one, you have perhaps Kafka clusters that are uh, hosting all these user activity streams. You have to deploy this stream processing cluster. You write your code, that is the aggregation, geo aggregation code, you deploy it as a job on this cluster. You might have counts and you want to serve it through the dashboard app, so now you use your external database. And then you finally have your dashboard app that reads the counts and then highlights it on that UI. Now contrast this with vision two, you have your Kafka cluster that hosts all those activity events. You just have your dashboard app. What it does is it embeds the streams library, it processes it, it counts those, and it stores the counts in the local embedded engines, the local state engines. And Kafka Streams API allows the local engines to be query, queryable. So in your dashboard app, not only are you querying, or not only are you storing all those uh, state or the aggregated numbers, you're also able to query it and display it on your dashboard. So in this picture, I think it probably summarizes all of what Kafka's Streams API is about, is essentially simplicity. Now, what I'd like to you know, conclude with is a lot of these ideas, this, um, this observation about what batch processing really is. You know, it is, it is a style of processing where you can take a window of data and you process it, and after you're done with that window, you shut down, then you wake up at a particular future point in time, you process the next window, and you, and you keep doing that. So let's assume that a you know, Streams app can do that. You know, it, it processes a window and then it shuts down. Now contrast that with um, you know, traditional Streams app, which is that when it finishes processing that windows, it doesn't shut down, it keeps going on, and it keeps processing the next window as it arrives. So you'll realize that you know, this is nothing but a different style of processing on the same abstraction. Essentially, logs actually help unify batch and stream processing on a single reusable layer. So to conclude, you know, this is, um, the streams and the Connect API along with Kafka, it really encapsulates everything about what streaming ETL means and looks like. And remember this messy picture. It helps you actually clean that up and end up with a much more you know, scalable and um, manageable ETL architecture. This is the vision that we started Kafka with. This is the vision that some of us have at Confluent is really to make all your data available everywhere and, and immediately. If you were intrigued about some of these ideas, if it was uh, you know, too, much, uh, too much too soon, then we have a tutorial on Friday if you were uh, to dive deeper into Connect and Streams. One of the Confluent members is gonna walk you through that. We blog a lot about these uh, ideas, so if you hit confluent.io slash blog, you will be able to catch up uh, to the latest of what we are all up to. And with that, I'd like to conclude this talk. Thank you very much for listening.